Um, I'm going to read from Revelation 1, but I, I think I'm not even going to ask you to look at it. I think I'm going to ask you to do something else. Uh, you can hear my voice, read it. Um, I'd love for you to think about this. Um, think about... Um, Think about being 95 years old. <clears throat> Think about remembering your brother, your cousins, your best friends. Um, think about all that you'd seen in your life with Jesus, your life as a fisherman. And then think about all of them are gone. All of them are gone. Every single one. And you've been sent from Ephesus to this remote island, which I think, if I'm correct, Theologia, does, we don't even have a water source here on the island, do we? No, no, no. It was the worst place of its size here because there's no source of water. Someone could die. You guys hear that? It's literally, they would live on rainwater. And so he is truly exiled here. And also, We've experienced it on the boat a little bit. That when we were traveling, you see the sun and the water, you see the islands. You can really understand that the whole the whole Mediterranean is a place for mythology. Everything you see like awakens something in you. So you have all of these visions that that John is having. Uh, and so I'm thinking about him at this late stage of his life where he's reflecting on all of this. And again, he was he had the closest friendship with Jesus, such a close friendship and love. And I think one of the things we always talk about is we always talk about the gospel offers friendship with God, right? Jesus says, I don't call you my servants anymore. I call you my friends. So you think of this incredibly intimate uh, that I've spent my whole life inviting people to say, I've, I've begged people my whole life to say, don't think about how much you love Jesus. It doesn't even matter. Think about how much Jesus loves you. That's what really matters. That's the whole point of this, of the gospel. He came. He initiated. And so what I'd love for you to do maybe is just close your eyes or look out. You can see the beautiful, the scenario, this really rugged place. You can imagine the sun going down, the water. And then John, you would think of all people, would describe Jesus in this like almost like John did, like almost like in First John, where he says, "What we've seen, our hands have touched, our eyes have seen." Well, now you put all that together, John, First John, especially, and then we come to Revelation of this Jesus, this vision of Jesus. So let me read it to you, and just just let it soak into your heart. This is the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. What, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words in his prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth, every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every culture, all peoples on earth, on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. Very possibly, he was down in that cave below. 
And I heard behind me a loud voice, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you've seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. I think when we started dreaming up these trips to Israel and to Greece, part of it is we wanted to see the closeness of Jesus, right? The friendship of Jesus. The Jesus that sweated like we did. He walked, you know, he walked the road. He, he was like Paul. He never took a shortcut. And everything that we've experienced, he's already gone before us and knows us. But in Revelation, Paul is saying for every everyone who loves Jesus, everyone who's ready to turn a corner, there's this moment where you turn the corner and you see Jesus for who he really is. That every other moment of your life has just been a little tiny snapshot, right? Like a little tiny glimpse of seeing Jesus. Because Jesus said, to see me is to see the Father. But now John is seeing him in all his revealed glory. C.S. Lewis writes that when we see Jesus, part of his, uh, from his sermon, The Weight of Glory, he says, when you see him, you will actually begin to reflect that glory so that when you think of anyone who's died in Christ, were you to see them now, C.S. Lewis would say, you would be tempted to fall on your knees and worship them. They, are so, they would be so glorious. Jeff, think about your dad. That were you to see him now, it would be, it would be this overwhelming glory because he would be reflecting the Shekinah glory of God of this Jesus now that that ultimately our lives, our goal is that we would more and more reflect his glory and his majesty. And I think you could make a lifetime study of this, but imagine the this is the image that we saw in the Stoa in the in the Agora in Athens. Remember when we when we were down on the level of the that beautiful statue trying to capture this image of this unbelievable the perfect man fully God, fully man, and uh, this incredible image along the way. This was the image when I was a senior in high school. I can remember where I was in my room. Um, I remember reading Revelation and just getting a glimpse of this for the first time and saying, I, I want my life to be fully devoted. Like whatever time I have, whatever life that I would be devoted because Jesus Christ is coming right on the clouds in great glory and he's going to draw all people to himself and our our dream is is in our lives we about seeing people drawn to Jesus Christ and it's not the judgment that I that I've ever thought about it's the glory to be drawn to the beauty like why why would you turn away from this beauty and this glory this majesty imagine his voice like the sound of rushing waters someday we're going to hear that voice in a way that no, that no one living has ever heard. It's really incredible to think about. And so this image didn't come from Paul, didn't come uh, from Peter, who really were the authors of the New Testament, or from Luke. It came in this last moment 
really, in, in a sense, maybe the last living witness of Jesus. And at the end, he gets this vision of Jesus Christ <laughs> that we get to carry in our hearts. And you know, when you come to that last moment, and a lot of us in this, a lot of us in this group, we're gonna we're gonna be there when each other dies. I know because I'm already experiencing it. And every time I think about it, I think they are going to step from this life into the presence. And who's going to be there? The Lord Jesus Christ. Feet like bronze, eyes like blazing fire, ready to welcome us. Because his love and his work, his presence among us has purified us. And has given an invitation that whosoever will may come. And so when I'm on Patmos, it's very special. Because this is the only place in the history of the world that anyone ever got what the actual picture of the glorified Jesus is like right here in this place. So I think this is the last really significant biblical place we're going to visit. I hope that vision of Jesus would compel us that we would do whatever. Like we'd give, give it all. We'd follow with every last breath of our life. We'd use all of our resources and energy to bring him glory along the way. And that's why this is such an inspiring place to me. Pretty cool. So, in light of that,